full consciousness that we may absorb this life force and grow in spirit until our whole being radiates with light as did the symbolic form of Jesus in the sun, the picture of the arisen Christ. In spirit, I know that there is no death, no separation from love or loved ones. There is no time when I have not been and no time when I will not be. As I develop and grow in the Christ life, I even more individualized, I become more and more absorbed into that infinite glory, which I worship as God. The more beautiful the form I create, the more I will radiate the light, the life of the Christ, and become at one with the Creator, our Father, Mother God. And so it is. Amen. <clears throat> Well, I want to welcome you all here from the great state of Minnesota, <laughs> uh, where it's also sunny and bright. So I'm happy for that. Thank you, God. <clears throat> so as many of you know, I love history, like Reverend Sandy said last week, that I love history. And so I always try to put my talk in a certain context of history and of understanding coming from the, the Christian scriptures. So this time of preparation of Easter <clears throat> is linked to the preparation of Christmas. As we prepare for the coming of that Christ consciousness within us during the Advent season <clears throat> and celebrate its fullness within us as creations of the I Am, the Logos of the Word of God made manifest, we also prepare for the mastery of that I Am nature within us by, as Charles Fillmore would state, the interior thought concentration of the subtle essences of the organisms that are transmuted to vibratory energies and become important factors in building up that pure body, which is to triumph over death. And that's right out of the metaphysical Bible. So a bit of history here. Whether this story that we read of Jesus entering Jerusalem through this very special gate. <clears throat> and by the way, the gate that he was coming into was the gate foretold in the, in the older scriptures that the Messiah would come through that gate. So everything that was written was put into the context of afterwards of saying this from the Older Testaments and from tradition. This is how we portray Jesus as we know him as that Christ presence. So to the Mount of Olives, where we hear a lot, we'll hear more about that in the coming days as we prepare for that time of the, um, the scourging of the pillar and those times before his death and then his resurrection. The Mount of Olives is actually this site based on Zechariah of the final battle against the nations, according to Zechariah. Also, it's a hill opposite Jerusalem, the traditional place for the Messiah's appearance. The idea of the colt and the branches stem from Zechariah and from other Older Testament passages. Kings and rulers rode a donkey or an ass as an accepted bearer of royalty. And in the metaphysical Bible, this is represented by the man consciousness animal that is part, part of that is typified by the donkey. And it's being ridden into Jerusalem by Jesus, portrays the mastery by the I am of the animal nature and its manifestation. Jerusalem means habitation of peace and signifies spiritual consciousness. So as we look at this story and we break this apart, here we have this person that realized his divine nature, his Christ consciousness, this Jesus of Nazareth. And he was purposefully in the story riding on a donkey 
and having people throw their cloaks down in front of him and on the donkey itself, and him entering into this certain gate, going through into the city of Jerusalem, all representing that journey that we all make from that animal consciousness to that spiritual consciousness, uh, winning the mastery over that animal nature into spiritual consciousness. Again, this story is being told not from a literal perspective, but for a purpose for the early Christian community to hear of the connection between what was foretold by the prophets and the life of Jesus of Nazareth. The disciples do not fully understand all of this in its context until after Jesus' death and resurrection, and after their own waking into further realization of that I am consciousness within their early community. <clears throat> so what are some of these aspects that we can during this time of Lent? And as I said last, last time I was with you, let's engage in new thought or let's eliminate negative thinking. So here are just a list of some of those things that <clears throat> we have this opportunity during this Lenten season to become more conscious of and, and how this animal nature within us is affecting our reality and working through those in a way to come out the other side, which is to say to realize our own spiritual divinity, our own true consciousness, and to come out that side of going through this spiritual journey as Jesus did, from the whole aspect of dying to self and resurrecting to that Christ consciousness. So these are just a few that I would invite us to continue thinking about during this Lenten season and during this coming week. <coughs> so one has popped up pride, the kind that is not able to admit our own genuine weakness that in turn blocks our spiritual growth and transforming that into humility, true and genuine acceptance of our own strengths and weaknesses. And some of us, we might have heard the phrase putting on an air um, with this popped up pride. So. <coughs> Being, being not able to admit our own frailty in our human form and our own weaknesses and relying on others uh, and not, not being able to rely on others um, in that journey. And another one is self-pity, feeling sorry for ourselves, feeling that people don't respect us or love us or feeling hopeless or victims of circumstances. And how have we seen that currently in our world? How do we transmute that into loving our neighbor as ourselves? We do that here at Unity by the Jonah program, the community table, and other ways that we show up as a community to mirror that Christ consciousness in life. This we do by realizing how to love and respect ourselves and in turn to love and respect others. And we've seen a lot of this lately as we watch the news or we might even be feeling the insecurities of the energy around us. I think I've mentioned in the past in the family systems theory, there's an example of anxiety that we all feel. And we are very much like a herd of cattle, as uh, Martha, Martha Creek would say. Uh, this example is we're a herd of cattle, and one of them runs, runs up to the electric fence and accidentally touches the electric fence. And it gets shocked, and so it recoils away quickly from the electric fence. But within a nanosecond, the other herd of animals also recoil and start running the other direction. And what does that mean? That we are all interconnected. So that anxiety moves from the one that touched the fence to the many <clears throat> that have not touched the fence or felt the pain. And how many of us here have felt that anxiety in our society or in our, our nation or around the globe? as we watch and hear of the news of this pandemic. So that's just another example of that and how many people have gotten into a sense of self-pity or feeling victims. One of the many, many that I've struggled with in my life is perfectionism, not being open to admitting my mistakes, my own or those of others. It's a fear of criticism that leads to settling setting unrealistic standards for myself and others. 
and when I cannot meet those standards, getting frustrated and angry with myself or others. Then comes the impatience. As others cannot meet my standards, one of the wise sayings from the 12-step tradition is progress, not perfection. Having that freedom in our own spiritual growth to admit that human side of ourselves, really being okay with that and allowing that to be transmuted into spiritual perfection. Another one is guilt and shame. Guilt of the actions that we have done or not done, and shame feeling that we are not enough and that we are the problem. Turning from those feelings to one of self-acceptance. And one way with guilt is to go and make amends, ask for forgiveness, and also offer ourselves the freedom of self-forgiveness, claiming our own divine birthright. One thing with guilt and shame is there are so many of us that have a sense of shame in our life, a sense of guilt in our life, and how do we work through those coming out the other side to do what we have to do to make those amends? And as Jesus would say to the stories we read of him meeting people in the Newer Testament, go and sin no more. And that sinning, of course, is missing that mark. So we get to do this over. Thank you, God. So where in our life do we admit that we've done wrong? Do we make amends or ask for forgiveness? And we strive to do not miss that mark again, but we have that freedom to try again. I've been hearing a lot of the intolerance in our country lately as I've watched the news all sorts of examples of intolerance. Where have we been intolerant of others? How do we move from being intolerant to seeing the needs of others more clearly and accept them more humbly, especially if they are acting out of fear or a sense of lack? How do we practice more patience and understanding with where they are coming from? Even as we are seeking toilet paper, paper towels, and other things that we need in our daily life. And talking about fear, how do we handle our own fear and the fears of those close to us? How do we allow the feeling to be there and yet go beyond that fear to a place of acceptance and trust in a loving universe? When in our philosophy can help us to remember that the universe is for us and not against us that there is but one power, God, the omnipotent good. <coughs> I know, as many of you have, I'm sure, being closer to your family and spending more time with your family, these might have been tested in the recent history. I know here in my own family, my mother, my dad, and my sister and I, uh, I've seen examples of these in this last these last weeks. And yet, how do I hold that Christ consciousness? How do I have that patience and that love? How do I hold that high watch for my family here and for those loved ones around, not only here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but far beyond? I know I've had to sit down and take a deep breath and with each person here, try to understand their feeling and have patience with that and have compassion. And as I've done that, I've had to, to also look at my own fear, my own uh, insecurities about things, and that has been very good. So as this life I know is for me and not against me, I can take that deep breath and look with those loving eyes of a very loving universe and a loving heart of the universe and work through that, coming out the other side. So in our philosophy, we are called all to ministry of walking this spiritual path and to realize that we are spiritual beings having this human experience. These topics that I've mentioned are but a few that we have been invited to go within and really look at our own sense consciousness to become more awakened to its limitations and take up the invitation to walk as Jesus did to his crucifixion and to experience our own Easter, our own resurrection into a spiritual consciousness. 
What does that look like? Imagine you're coming out of the other side of this journey, this time, and what does that feel like? What does that look like? I've been trying to imagine the end of this pandemic and just seeing as many people I'm sure did after the 1918 pandemic and the diphtheria pandemic and the polio epidemic and the AIDS epidemic, SARS and MERS epidemics, all of these throughout our time to try to picture what this looks like at the end of this on the other side and what we can learn from this. And how do we, in that newer consciousness, move on from here? So do we experience the love and the joy of having that spiritual awakening? <clears throat> Have we come out the other side of this experience, having a more deep and genuine experience of having faith, having, excuse me, the faith of Jesus? Jesus states that his disciples would do even greater things than he did before he left. We are called to this ministry. And I wish to quote from Hart Anderson from United Theological Seminary, his commencement address in 2015. <coughs> the ancient Celtic people thought of death as the river hard to see. Those of us called into ministry as leaders in the church, whether we're chaplains on the cancer floor or pastors in the parish, whether we're organizing for justice or working with little children, whether we're teaching or tent making, we have as our task to help people find that river hard to see. We go with them to those waters, right down to the riverbank, and there we help them move from oppression to freedom, from despair to hope, from the fears of the night to the grace that comes fresh with the voice due of the dawn. We help them move from life to life. Ministry is a privilege, but not in what it brings to us, but rather in where it brings us. So we are not people of the crucifixion, but of the resurrection. As we walk this spiritual path, let us remember our true nature, spiritual beings having a human experience, and to keep walking. Don't stop. This is not yet the full story of us. I have been consoled by the ways that we have as humans connected as we live through this pandemic. Wonderful stories of hope, of laughter, of coming together, reaching out as we can. And like we did in our family yesterday, we did some stress baking. We made cookies and nut bread. And that was a lot of fun. So how do we do this around our own family and in our own community as we can? Let this bring us hope and joy, love and faith in this journey that we are all on. Ministry indeed is a privilege but not in what it brings to us, but rather in where it brings us. It is bringing us to that resurrection experience. As Fillmore would state, that interior thought concentration of the subtle essences of the organisms that are transmuted to vibratory energies and become important factors in building up that pure body, which is to triumph over death. So I invite you this coming week and into that resurrection experience next Sunday. How do we continue to walk this spiritual path? How do we continue to look at our own humanness with an understanding and compassion and to look at others' humanness in that same understanding and compassion? And as we ride with Jesus, that donkey, across that path which is made for kings, queens, and other royalties, coming in through that messianic door into Jerusalem, how do we go experience our own crucifixion and our own resurrection in this coming week? And with that, I close. So it is.